I'd like to say hi to everybody out there. My name is Miguel Montero Baker. I'm one of the vascular surgeons at Baylor College of Medicine, Division of Vascular Surgery and Endovascular Therapies. And I am here in Houston, Texas. What you observe in the back is the medical center. A medical center obviously with a big history for advances in cardiovascular medicine. And it'll be my pleasure to join you during Icarus for the latest and greatest in advancements of vascular and endovascular care. I hope you can join us and I'm very excited to see you soon online. Stay safe. Pura vida. And I, I want to welcome our, our guests, our colleagues, uh, Grzegorz Halena from Gdańsk. It's nice to, to, to see you. Uh, Dr. Wojtaszek, I haven't seen you so, 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 so long. Uh, he's Polish uh, interventional radiologist working in 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 UK. Uh, Thomas Baltrunas from Vilnius. It's it's great to see you. And uh, and Jan Skowroński from uh, Birmingham. <laughs> it's great to see you too. <laughs> and also <laughs> again because uh, we we were talking with Jan at the beginning of our webinar that we were looking for the ladies. Yeah. And I found another lady from Poland, from Bydgoszcz. <laughs> she is wonderful. Oh, yeah. And she is a wonderful specialist. And uh, so uh, I, I want to welcome uh, Joanna Wiśniewska and Artur Mieczkowski from Bydgoszcz. So let's go. Uh, the problem is with Miguel Montero Baker, who, is little, who will be a little bit late. So we will uh, we'll start with Grzegorz. Alena, uh, with his topic, Rendezvous Technique for Femoral Recognition. Grzegorz, floor is yours. Hi, my name is Grzegorz Halena. I'm a vascular surgeon working at a uh, medical university of Gdańsk, uh, which is a city located in the north of Poland. Okay, I'm starting to share the screen. Let me know if it works. Um, Okay, so um, uh, good evening, everybody. My job, I guess, is to convince you that going retrogradely is an essential part of every interventionist armamentarium. Um, and, you know, there are many ways to do that. If you go above the knee for P1 segment of this LSFA, many people use support catheters or four French sheets or five French sheets, but then in the end, with the problem of outside compression or, uh, or using intravascular balloon tamponade because using uh, two or three millimeter uh, distal axis diameter. So historically people started with P2 axis, but this is cumbersome because the patient has to be in a prone position. And again, probably you would use a four, five inch sheet. And again, intra, uh, intra, intravascular balloon tamponade and outside compression at the end. I think that nowadays we tend to go sheetless from below the knee. Uh, you can go with a four French sheet if it's proximal anterior tibial, but I had one case of uh, AV fistula as a due to, to a four French sheet. But I think that it doesn't make any sense to use a uh, very distal retrograde access for our daily cases in the uh, distal uh, SFA or P1 segment. Uh, this is another patient of mine, uh, P2 access, and you see there's a lot of calcium, so it has to be done in a prone position. Uh, and I had to use sheet because I need um, mm -hmm. variability and stability from the catheter. So but then again, at the end, the there's a problem of intravascular ballooning and uh, securing uh, securing bleeding. So this is, I guess, this is the majority of our patients when we have a distal SFA occlusion or, and relatively free from disease P1 segment sometimes also distal SFA. So the question is, do I have to go below the need to get retrograde access? Um, these are some anatomical considerations, as you see, um, the vein is well behind the artery, so there's the contact here, no, no risk of AV fistula, but it's a straightforward way of getting into the artery. So, uh, after my first catastrophic ex uh, experiences with using a six French sheet for retrograde, I switched to a four French, as you see here in the picture, but again, in the end, you have to use intravascular ballooning and outside compression. And of course, vascular closure devices are probably off label, and I think anybody uses them in that region. So the question is, can can my di diameter of my intervention of my distal axis can be even smaller? Because if you use a four or five inch sheet, you create a hole of two, 2.5 millimeters. And this is my 
a daily driver, I'm using a simple, very simple, unsophisticated tools, which is a always incompatible Pacific class balloon from Metronic, which has a diameter of less than one millimeter. I use this as a support catheter. I use CXI from Cook in the past. It was too slippery. If you broke the tip, it was completely useless. So I switched to a very simple device. And this is my ensemble regular needle, V18 guide wire, which has a very stiff uh, uh, steel core, and a new, fresh, non undeployed O18 compatible balloon as a support catheter. And it works in the majority of cases. So this is a typical case. Um, by seven centimeters of calcium to cross and you think you cross and you end up being subintimal. And I don't think it makes much sense to spend more than 10, 15 minutes to um, try to get back into the um, uh, intraluminal, uh, internal portion of the P1 because you enlarge the dissection in the sub subintimal space. So I, what I do today, I immediately switch to puncturing the P1 segment of uh, of the popliteal artery, I use the C18 guide wire, and it works. Uh, and he, of course, I'm using the O18 compatible balloon. This is Fox. Uh, sorry, this is not a Fox. Uh, this is um, uh, the one from from uh, Matronic. You see the markers of the balloon. This is enough to cross the majority of lesions without. Of course, you lose torqueability and maneuverability, but works in many cases. If you have problems with the wire rendezvous which is the most desired option. Uh, this is the second option that I use. This is a reverse card uh, technique. I use a balloon, but I bring the balloon from above. I do not, I never inflate the balloon. I, I insert it sheetlessly from below. And it works again with the majority of cases. Again, I don't use the card technique. I prefer the reverse card technique. And this is how it works. You bring another balloon from above, you rupture the membrane, and by gently torquing and pushing the V18 guide wire, uh, will find a way to the true lumen of the superficial femoral artery, as you can see here. And of course, uh, navigating to the catheter of the sheet with a V18 guide wire is relatively easy, and you end up with a through and through 300 centimeter guide wire through the femoral axis and through the distal puncture uh, axis size. And then keeping the wire in place, all you have to do is have to remove the balloon you just insert it from below and you use the same balloon and insert it from above through the femoral sheet. You bring it down and of course you cross the puncture side further, but you have to flip the guide wire because the hard end of the guide wire has to be switched for the soft end of the guide wire. Um, sorry, I go back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, you can see on the right inflating the puncture side. It usually takes me two minutes to secure bleeding. There's no bleeding after it. If I see some leakage, I repeat the ballooning another two minutes, and this is enough for the majority of patients. Um, okay. And this is the final result. As you see, two minutes of ballooning, no bleeding. Of course, the patient had to be stented because of the calcium. You, you can appreciate it. As much as I like working from the ipsilar going downstream, in those Cases when you anticipate this new puncture, I think it's it's much more e convenient for the operator to work from the contrast approach because you don't have to move. You stand in the one place and you control both the camera sheet and the distal puncture sheet uh, with uh, with your hands without moving anywhere. And in some cases, it's even difficult to cross the lesion with the O18 uh, balloon. Then you can use gentle traction, pulling both ends of the V18 guide wire to cross the lesion. And this is how it looks at the end. As you see, no bleeding, no external compression, no VCD devices, no hematoma. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, sheet plate T1 approach using the three simple tools I just showed you is successful in 80 to 90% of cases. You can always upsize the whole French sheet or the whole catheter of the choice, but then you make the whole bigger. You don't need extra tools, you don't need any uh, external compression. And of course, you minimize the distal axis diameter, and therefore you minimize complications. And for the majority of my patients, two minutes of ballooning uh, is enough to stop bleeding. Thank you very much. So, uh, Grzegorz, how often do you use popliteal uh, axis? Okay, how often do I use it? Well, I try to go anti-grade as much as I can, but I, uh, as I said before, um, 
I think that in 10% of SSA cases, you need some form of retrograde access. And I found this one to be the easiest, the quickest. There's no excuse that I don't have a, a support catheter or appropriate sheet. You just, you always have the guide wire, you always have the balloon, and you always have the needle. And of course, my advice is always prep the patient before if you anticipate retrograde stick, because that, again, is safe on you. Spend two additional minutes at the beginning of the procedure, and then at the end, during the procedure, I have to think you just, you know, anesthetize the skin and just stick your, skin, you stick your needle into the tibials or into the P1, P2, P3, whatever, wherever. Thank you. So we have Grzegorz. Uh, the, uh, yes, uh, Grzegorz, I have a question because uh, uh, at the uh, past se uh, session, we, we were talking about the time-consuming uh, procedures. Uh, in your hand, how, how, how long it takes to do uh, this kind of procedure you, you have shown us? Well, as I said before, I usually uh, spend 10, maximum 15 minutes trying to cross from the antegrade. And if that fails, I immediately switch to retrograde stick. And I think it takes another 15 minutes maximum. So it's not a Thank you very much. Okay. So, so let's go to the UK. Uh, Mikolai, c could, you, could you tell us about the uh, art, uh, venous arterialization? It's, it's well known sure. right now, the procedure. I don't think it's easy. B b we have a special device, but it, this device is very expensive. I, I, I think that many of us are not, uh, not able to, to use it. and We can't afford, especially in Poland. But uh, you, you, probably you will show us how to do it easier and cheaper. Definitely, yeah, definitely. And it also bases upon retrograde access, which uh, Greg just showed us, uh, just in a slightly different location. So first, just to define the clinical problem, we have something called the sad foot, and that's small arterial disease inside the foot itself. And these are going to be um, a whole patients with uh, diabetes, renal failure, or patients with you know, the frequent flyers with previous arterial disease that was, uh, we've been treating them and they keep keep coming back, yeah? So at some point, these patients are going to de develop a no rescue situation. And these are the patients that could potentially be eligible for venous arterialization. We have to differentiate between the bad patients, that means the large vessel disease and the small vessel disease. And there's also a very useful scale, um, the SCAD scoring system with the degrees from zero to three, um, sorry, from zero to two, showing you the various stages of progression of this disease. So once we're in this kind of situation, we know that there's no other option that we can offer, and most likely these patients will not heal on best medical therapy. Where are we with best medical therapy? We are getting better, and there's a study uh, from 2012 and then repeated in 2015, a meta-analysis showing that we are progressively, the drugs are getting good enough to get us out of a lot of problems, tr troubles just by just by using them, just by thinning the blood. But still, we have 20% of patients that will only heal, but the rest will have some kind of dire consequences involving death, amputation, or non-healing wounds. And we're talking about Rutherford 5s and 6. So these are patients that have a, a very meager quality of life, and they're generally very poorly. Uh, now, as Professor Oshkinish mentioned, there is a dedicated device, the lymph flow, and that's where more, most of the data come from. But the method is not new. The endovascular approach is fairly new, but the method itself has been used by our Russian colleagues previously. I think it's got maybe 50 or 60 years on it. The uh, surgical connection between the um, uh, arterial system and the deep venous system to reversely perfuse the ischemic foot. Um, other options that are still under our investigation would be the stem cells. But what we're here to talk about, unfortunately, there's not there's you know the, the trials have been ongoing, but there's not very not a lot of positive news coming from these trials, um, unfortunately. While these methods, then the vascular methods, are being heavily provoked, promoted. Most of the data, like I said, is from the lymph flow methods, but there's also the Piper technique and the VAS technique, the VAS technique which I use, and these are the people behind these homemade techniques, fabulous guys, I have to say that they're wonderful people, very helpful when it comes to initiating a service, and very knowledgeable also when it comes to these diseases. Like I mentioned, the general principle is to connect the artery to the deep venous system and retrogradely perfuse the foot through the venous system. When it comes to clinical data, unfortunately, uh, most of the data is collected from the lymph flow program, but as you look at the numbers, 
there's really not a lot of patients coming in. The pilot study, the Promise, and the Promise International study did not really have a lot of patients, while they had a lot of centers involved. So nobody really has a tremendous amount of experience in this method, with everybody amounting to a couple of cases. And all of us are trying to reach the conclusions whether this is worth it or not. And in some cases, I guess it is. Not everywhere, though. Wound healing. We can see that from the lymph load data, we do have a progressive amount of wound healing the first nine months, which is fabulous. But if you look at the amputation-free survivals, they're still going to be around 80 to 70%, which really doesn't make it different from best medical treatment. So DVAs for now are not a game changer when it comes to this. It's just another, another method in our toolbox, a bit like the retrograde approach, a bit like other stuff that we do routinely. It has to be considered but it's nothing like the holy grail of um, uh, uh, CI, CLI fighters. Yeah? And the ALPS multi-center registry is also another database of data also involving the lymph flow device. And it also repeats on an all-comer basis what the trials have already shown. That means that there is an amputation-free survival of around 70% uh, after one and two years after the procedure. Now, because we're going to be talking about cheaper devices than the lymph flow, uh, we got two different techniques, at least two different techniques that I'm aware of. One is a piper technique, which uses an IVUS, the pioneer IVUS, and then uses a reentry catheter to transfer from the posterior tibial artery to the posterior tibial vein. And then exactly the same way as a lymph flow device would do it, we create the fistula and repeat blood flow down into the foot. Now, this is more a radiology kind of a friendly device because it just uses fluoro beans. There's no ultrasound. There's no costly ivus. And the only thing that you have when it comes to the cost of the materials is the two snares and a couple of wire bands. So it's nothing really different than the materials we normally use. So this is this is this is one of my patients, a patient that is a what we call a frequent flyer, uh, very distal disease. I've recanalized them a couple of times. The posterior tibial. That went on for a bit, then the anterior tibial, the posterior tibial closed, and are gone again a couple of weeks, a couple of months down the line, and no progress when it comes to healing of his um, wounds. So at some point, we decided, and I did a lot of crazy stuff. I tried to puncture the plantar artery to recanalize the posterior tibial retrogradely. That didn't really work out that much. Um, but yeah, I, I tried my best. And at some point, I just exploited every endovascular arterial option that I could think of. So venous arterialization would be the next. Now, when it comes to approach, we're looking at um, having an anti-grade approach uh, because we want to shorten the distance from the two connections as much as possible. We're going to be using um, any chitin the snare would actually do. And under ultrasound, you target one of these veins. The posterior tibial artery has two um, uh, veins that, that, that go around it. Whenever one is easier to puncture, you puncture that. You put a French sheath in and you have bilateral access, one from the arterial side and one from the venous side. Afterwards, you align two snares, and this is the crucial part. Through the skin, you puncture bullseye technique. You puncture through the snares so that the needle goes through two braids of the snare, and then you put a wire in, and I usually put a 018 260 centimeter Turumo because it has enough flexibility so they can bend on both sides. And then you progressively, you take one of the part of the wire out from one side and then the remaining part of the wire out from the two side, creating a wire joint um, arterial venous fistula. Now, this isn't the end of the, of, the, of the work that you have to do. Then you have to start connecting the veins on the foot. Now, what you're looking at is there's, there's four groups of veins. You got the deep plantar veins and you got the superficial dorsal veins. So this is the deep venous system, number three, and this is the um, superficial system. So you want to proximally connect the arterial supply to the deep venous supply, let that flow into the foot and release it through the superficial venous system. So you need to connect number three and number one. This is a superficial vein, while this is the dorsalis pedis vein, it's also a deep vein. So you want to avoid this and just make sure that you have a nice loop coming into the superficial venous system. There's a couple of tricks that you need to know before you actually start doing these. And that's about that, but basic, basic venous anatomy. 
uh, once you do your angiography and you can see the outflow of venous, of, of, of venous blood the way you want it, you do aggressive angioplasty using a four and five millimeter balloon. Make sure you connect that up to the point of the fistula. And then you start stenting that with Vioband stents from top to bottom. And it's also important not to finish the Vioband too early on because over at the calcaneum, you have the tarsal tunnel. Now the tarsal tunnel is a thick band of ligament that actually compresses a lot of the things. You've got a couple of veins here, you've got the artery, and you've got the vein here. And unfortunately, the way it's built, it is compresses whatever you do over here. So you have to have the stent going under the tarsal tunnel, otherwise the entire procedure will not work. So as you can see here, we tend to put the stent in a bit lower than we'd normally think, you know, intuition would dictate. Here the stent, I have to admit, is a bit too low. You have the very characteristic valve around the calcaneum around here. So you need to also break that of either with a balloon or, or with a stent and then balloon it out. And then you have that nice flow of blood through the fistula, um, through the deep venous system, and then release into the superficial venous system. Now, like I said, there are a couple of mistakes in the way this procedure was done, minor mistakes, but I have to say that um, being a bit of a pedantic guy, I, I, they really kind of uh, ail me in a way. Like I said, the stent is slightly too low, it could have been released at least two centimeters higher up. And also that kind of venous uh, uh, fistulization that you have here, that there's too much early venous re release of the arterial supply of the blood is also a bit of a mistake. Technically, this procedure could have been done slightly better. On the foot, what you're aiming to is, and this is something that has, it's, it's not a lot of people talk about it, but Bruno Miliari, the author of the Piper Technique, says that it is actually quite an, uh, uh, an important element of the game, is to devolve the veins up, up, up until the first um, main vein of the, of the first toe. So you really want to get back inside and with a three millimeter balloon, try to balloon this vein over here. This gives you more flow into the forefoot, which will also promote healing. What is worrying about the procedure, because like I said, the procedure is technically quite simple, is what happens afterwards. And afterwards, a lot of things happen, and we call it generally the venous storm, because there's so much blood rushing in from the venous system, and there's the outflow really can't cope with that amount of arterial blood. We have a bit of venous stagnation, but also we have the Venturi effect, which by the amount of blood coursing through the forefoot steals a bit of arterial blood from the toes. Therefore, the patients will have both swelling and steel syndrome in the distal part of the toes. So unfortunately, if you have, for example, dry gangrene, a lot of that because of that venous stagnation is going to turn into wet gangrene. Um, and there's a couple of things that might go on, for example, a bit of dieback. And honestly, the first couple of days, it doesn't look pretty. What you're aiming for, unfortunately, because there's little chance you're going to be able to reverse the steel syndrome in the distal parts of the toes, you are looking for a forefoot amputation. But you don't want to do this too early on around the procedure or after the procedure, because you want the PO2s to increase to such a level in which a tension-free flap can be sustained after the amputation. So this can't be done early on. You're trying to wait around six weeks after the procedure, and by that time, you have to debride you have to get all the stuff out, treat with antibiotics, treat the swelling in order to prevent any kind of infection and die back in the places that don't look too healthy. And gradually, gradually, the PO2s will increase and you will get your desired effect of a lower limb salvage. So initially, the 24-7 close-up uh, follow-up is super important and management of the pain because ischemic pain when it comes to stealing of blood from the toes is super, is super painful. So you're looking at perineural epidural catheters and keeping the patient in for at least a couple of days, if not weeks after the procedure. This is a, not a procedure that can be done uh, under a day case. Venous overload is going to be scary for you, less so for the patient who doesn't usually know what's going on, but you are going to be worried about the stagnation of blood flow inside the foot because it just doesn't look pretty. The foot is nice and warm, but you have to be aware that most of the blood is coursing through the venous system. And before the arterial bed arterializes and all the collaterals develop at a, at a cellular level, that was still going to take some time. 
patients, you are going to be tempted just to abandon the procedure and say, let's cut off the leg and just, you know, get rid of the problem. But if you do wait it out, you might get the desired effect. You won't always get the desired effect. And still 30 or 40 patient, percent of the patients will end up with an amputation. So be aware of this. And then bring a tissue to the flow. Be aggressive about this. Don't, don't you know, never, always, always, always prepare for a four foot amputation. Don't think about saving the toes too much. When it comes to post-procedural management, blood thinners, this is important. There's no consensus about which ones to use. Uh, we use vitamin K inhibitors with a single antiplatelets, but I've heard people use dual antiplatelets uh, um, uh, with a vitamin K inhibitor. And there's also people using DOAX with clopidogrel. Whatever you want, you have to do both antiplatelet and anticoagulation at the same time. When it comes to imaging, Always think about on-demand angiovenography whenever you're worried, whenever you're worried about having too much dieback, for example, or, you know, things not progressing day by day, you want the, the, the way you want it, because sometimes you will have to focalize flow. And I'll show that in the next slide. Post-procedural duplexes, if the flow is under 100 mils per minute, you are in dire straits, you might be having a fistula malfunction, and you, won't want, you will have to address that also with an angiovenography. If you have PO2 monitoring, and I know not everybody does, you looking at these values, and if they start to increase, you're in the good zone, you're in the green zone. If something happens with the PO2 values and they start declining, that means you are having early dysfunction of your fistula. So technically, procedure is quite simple. It's the patient management afterwards that is causing most of the problems. Now, if you do have dieback, for example, around these procedures, you might want to intervene once again and see, for example, to cut off all the draining roots to get even more arterial blood pumping inside the tissues, trying to perfuse and open up all those latent dormant arteriovenous collaterals in the, in the meaty part of the foot. This is how these coiling looks like. So from this, if you close off all the deep draining veins and just have flow into the deep venous system, one root and one root outflow, you are going to concentrate more of that blood, more of that arterial blood into that ischemic tissue bed, which is what you're looking for. Arterial occlusions, these happen a lot. Everybody reports them. At least half of the patients, maybe not at least half, but around half of the patients, you have to prepare that you are going to re-intervene and try to open this up again. You, know, you don't want this to last forever. You want this to last at least six weeks, hopefully a couple of months, before all these latent dormant collaterals down in the foot develop. So secondary patency, tertiary patency, quadruplacial patency is something that you're at, okay? Never forget that reintervening is nothing, is nothing on your slate. You have to do it. You have to keep this going as much as possible. Everybody is reporting patency loss and secondary interventions. This is a complication that you want to avoid at all costs. And this happens when you get venous thrombosis. You can get this, for example, sometimes if you do flow focalization too early in the game. If you do it as a one-stage procedure, do the fistula and then close off all the draining roots, this might happen early on. That's why we defer flow focalization to at least two weeks after the initial procedure, sometimes even more. If there's no dieback or you're not really worried about how the wound is progressing, then you don't have to do it. But it is recommended that at some point you try to have one straight route into the deep venous system with one straight outflow. If you get this, it's game over. It's fulminant and only amputation is the way to go, unfortunately. Fortunately, it doesn't really happen a lot. And if you take keep to the pointers, it won't happen to you. Thank you very much. Any questions for the discussion, I'm willing to take them on. So thank you for your excellent presentation. And my short question is uh, your typical patient, let's say during the first two months, how many reinterventions on the average you have to perform? Whenever, whenever you're worried, so it might be up to two, three interventions even. You, re you really want to not neglect these. I mean, nobody has tens of patients, hundreds of patients to be able to say, okay, this is the point when we're, when we're, it's okay. Yeah. Up to here, it's okay. We're so used to treating arterial patients, to demarcating, to letting things dry out, to giving antibiotics, to mummifying, you know, uh, uh, ischemic toes, that this patient turns bad very, very quickly. 
And like I said, most of the things is that you have no idea what's going on. You have a, a swollen foot, you have the development of gangrene, and you're thinking, okay, we're just going to get, get away with this problem. If you do an, an angiogram early on, and you can convince, I'm a radiologist, yeah? And you can convince your surgeons that, no, let's keep this a bit longer because this is still flowing, and we know that most of the, you know, the reversal of flow is going to take a couple of weeks, then you can you can stop your surgeon's hands from taking the guy's, the guy's leg off. So whenever necessary, whenever you're worried about things, you have to have that kind of documentation because you're just worried, yeah? It's a bit like, you know, um, you have a kid. Is he is he okay? Is he sleeping? Is he, you know, if he did it, do it, if he went to bed, is he still breathing? Yeah, it's like, it's like we're all of this are behaving like with a, with a child. We just don't really know all the spectrum of things that might happen. So we're looking at it super closely. And tell me, from, from an interventionist perspective, do you really trust your Doppler or you like the angio pictures? Angio. Exactly. Yeah. So whenever you need to, you have to, you know, it has to be part of the consent process. We're doing this procedure. We will most likely have to go around a couple of times, make sure that everything is going right, yeah? Okay, thank you very much. Nicolas, uh, 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 this is uh, Miguel Montero Baker from Houston. I'm sorry, I just kind of tail got the little tailwind of your presentation. And it's very interesting because this is exactly what I was doing right now. I was doing uh, a presentation just... <laughs> And so um, I was wondering, I when I have very f high flow volumes, I find that these patients become very ischemic, as you were saying. And have you found of, the yeah. sweet spot in your own research of what the flow volumes that lead to good wound healing versus those that just create an absolute mayhem and ischemic uh, toes in the first few hours? I have no. I mean, I don't think we can avoid the ischemic toes. You get a massive venturi effect with all the blood rushing out from the foot, and it's just stealing all that excess arterial blood that you know that, that tried to seep in there anyway. I think it's a bit, a bit like you know with a tips procedure. You oversize the stent, you get too much flow volume, like you said, and and then you have this kind of dire effect. Everybody's using five millimeter stents, but like you said, the volumes are still unpredictable. Yeah? What so kind of? You, we we've been able to carry on a very systematic follow-up and we're about to publish that data uh, but we've come to understand that the sweet spot's about two to fifty so 250 if, when it comes most of the minute yeah yeah so if we get flows in the 400s those are patients that usually have strong pulsatile pain in the plexus and or very severe ischemic pain so those are the patients that in a second look we'll bring them back within who knows less than a week hopefully and do embolization and focalization because as you limit the outflow vessels, then the yeah. obviously the fistula drops its volume, drops its volume. and the majority of the patients actually get asymptomatic. But kudos for your efforts because there's, these patients are truly those that we don't have a lot to offer. And unfortunately, yeah. I mean, yeah. as you'll see, they're coming up more. And you'll see in my presentation why the reason they're going to get even more and more uh, uh, in our clinics. So very good. I congratulate you on your efforts. Thanks, Miguel. Uh, this is uh, this is Jan Skowronski, Mikhail. Congratulations on on your cases. Um, I I haven't done it, but I love the technique with two snare devices. I think it's brilliant. And I think it's relatively simple and it's in, intuitive. It's super simple, and you'd be you know once you start. I mean, this is what I learned from the guys from Spain. Yeah, August Isa, fabulous guy. Um, uh, but I, honestly, I use a double snare technique now in a lot of arterial interventions, purely arterial. So, 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 so Mikoai, here is the dilemma. These are not easy cases. They are high-end cases, no matter how you look at it. And uh, in order to do high-end cases, you need to actually learn how to do them. So on one hand, you know, you see it and you can try it on your own. On the other hand, you have some potentially early commercially available systems or a system but that costs like ten, fifteen thousand dollars. But Miguel, are you using the? But you have are all you, the support you can get from the industry. On the other hand, you can learn on your own. Fairly simple technique, not that simple, but it's super cheap. So here is the dilemma that I see. Thank you. It is a dilemma, Miguel. Do you use the do you use the uh, Linflow device or do you do homemade? So c currently, I've been doing this now for three years, and mm -hmm. so. Uh, until approximately two months ago, uh, three months ago maybe, that we got off the ground with a PROMISE-2 study. 
you know, the FDA is incredibly stringent, specifically with this kind of uh, out of the box thing. So it's it's not entirely straightforward and it's a limited number of patients that actually can get into the lymph flow study currently. So we have been using it. Uh, but what we do the most is off the shelf, as you have all uh, brilliantly explained before. And yes, uh, August Isa has taught me a trick or two before. It's great to have Twitter and global education because we're all stealing little tricks from each other around the globe. Exactly. Yeah, I hooked up with him with, on, on LinkedIn, and it's you know it's a fabulous it's a fabulous community that we're developing over there. I yeah. See. Good. Kudos. Thank you, Gregos. Back to you. Do you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. We are okay. All oh, right. Okay. So, uh, Miguel, welcome. Uh, uh, why do you use a facial mask? Are you afraid of us? Uh, you know, unfortunately, I'm working in the cath lab, and I'm in an area where there's other people going in and out, out of the cath lab, and we are have extreme measures for COVID. So, <laughs> okay. I apologize. I'm not alone in a room where you could see my... my uh, but I'm trust me, I'm doing everybody a favor by not showing my ugly uh, uh, mug. Okay. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank I you. It's uh, my uh, turn, I believe, in the presentation, or do we have somebody else? Before? No, we uh, before we have Joanna Wisniewska and Artur Mieczkowski. They will showcase oh, okay. with uh, for French uh, device. Yes, please go ahead. You see, I can see they are not doing social distancing that well. <laughs> One moment, please. Uh, welcome to Icarus. <laughs> Second. Can you see presentation right now? We can see very well. Thank you. And uh, thank you. Uh, we would like to present some benefits of using four French compatible device uh, while treating some more popular disease. And we will try to answer this question. So when you think about the four French uh, compatible devices, we you can think in two ways, you want you can want uh, the procedures as less invasive as possible, uh, or you can get uh, more possibilities using a bigger sheet. Uh, as the first thing, when you compare uh, incision area, when you use a six French sheet and four French sheet, uh, using smaller sheet give you almost uh, fifty percent smaller holes. So because of this, you don't need to use any closure device. Uh, you can press the incision area uh, in a shorter period of time. And because of this, you have uh, much less complications, uh, like local hematoma. It was found uh, already a few years ago that uh, it might be almost 10 times uh, less complication in uh, incision area. Uh, and these hematomas, uh, after after four French uh, sheet, don't need any surgical repair. And what more, uh, you can perform whole procedure with uh, one long sheet and uh, four French compatible devices. Uh, have um, lower profiles, so it's uh, easier to go through difficult lesions, and uh, uh, also uh, the wires which you need to use uh, are more gentle, so you can use it in, in a smaller vessel, uh, for example, we don't need not only in canal uh, and also you use a lower dose of uh, contrast, so you have a lot of benefits for patient, you have lower bleeding risk, uh, you have lower risk of injury, uh, and also in a difficult patient uh, who have many scar tissue or uh, or high calcified vessel, you can use uh, a radial access or retrograde access. Uh, and as you can see, when you compare the pro profile of the four French compatible device with, uh, let's say, standard device, uh, in an example of Paseo, uh, when you see the Paseo 8 in the profile is, is much lower, so. It's, it's really easy to, uh, to use it in a smaller vessel than in difficult lesions. And what was uh, mentioned before, also the wall of the stent uh, in a Fort French compatible devices are much smaller. So especially in small vessels, uh, using this stent gives you a bigger uh, flow area uh, in the artery. Uh, but there are also some limitations. You cannot use uh, any thromboaspiration, not only at the old, uh, Atherectomy systems works in for, for French only diamond deck work with this, and also you cannot use outback or, or front runner or use uh, stand graft. Um, but what we uh, do very often uh, using for French uh, compatible devices, you also use a bigger sheet, 
uh, just to have more possibilities. We then we you can use uh, any guide wire size, uh, all balloon size, all other techniques like like you can use uh, kissing stand kissing balloons techniques, and easily treat uh, any complication. Uh, which uh, might happen during procedure. And in our case is uh, most of the these patients have some medical histories and uh, also vascular history. Uh, I will not explain every patient, uh, but only the, the, the scans. Uh, this is how it should uh, look uh, when you use Fort French uh, sheet going uh, ipsilateral antegrade. You can use, for example, V18 guide wire. And then some uh, balloon, uh, might be dracolutin balloon, like Paso in this case. Uh, as you can see, this patient has a really narrow artery, so uh, after uh, PTA, and due to these sections, we also use the uh, stand, which we choose Pulsar 18, which, uh, as I mentioned before, has a bigger uh, flow of the area inside uh, of the stand. And it, this is how it should work uh, in most cases, but sometimes it's not, not so easy. Also, using uh, small uh, devices uh, for French compatible devices, you can also go uh, retrograde. Like in this case, which is uh, the tibial arterial artery uh, and uh, navi cross uh, with V14 uh, guide wire. Then we do some angioplasty and uh, have a really, really nice uh, result. Uh, as you can see here, uh, is the stent uh, is also the pulsar 18 uh, in the flexible area of the knee. Uh, the outcome was was really uh, really nice, uh, but sometimes also the uh, femoral popliteal occlusive disease do doesn't end at uh, popliteal. Is in this case uh, we choose the um, ipsilateral integrate access uh, with a bigger sh uh, uh, sheet with uh, with six French. Uh, we use the V18 guide wire and and, and the plastic with the phantom. Uh, but unfortunately, after uh, this, we find uh, some complications like this, this rupture. And because uh, we used the uh, bigger, bigger sheet, we can uh, easily repair it. Uh, first, it was a prolonged PTA, but, but it's, it doesn't give a really good effect. So we decided to put the stand inside. And the final result is, is uh, quite nice. And the flow to the foot is, uh, is really good. And as you can see, using a pulsar stand and uh, in the uh, knee area, even when you flex at the knee, the, the stand behaves really nice. We don't have uh, any fractures, and the flow is not limited even uh, when the patient will move and, and uh, go down on his knees. Another uh, situation when the disease doesn't end at a popliteal artery, uh, as you can see in the second scan, there's almost nothing uh, below the knee. Uh, again, we used a uh, bigger sheet just to, to have more opportunities. First, firstly, we do angioplasty with uh, four French compatible balloon. Uh, but then we have not uh, really a good uh, result. Uh, below the knee, as you can see, the anterior artery almost doesn't exist. And the TB fibula trunk has some dissections. Uh, so we choose to use uh, two balloons to kissing balloon technique, but after this, uh, there was, I know it, it's, uh, it's in good, uh, some clot in the bifurcation. So we choose to put uh, kissing stand in this place, which is uh, easily to do with, with bigger sheet. And the final result was like this, and the flow to the foot was, was really, uh, really nice. Mm, and another situation, uh, very similar, you can also, uh, with using bigger sheet and uh, four French compatible device, you can easily secure uh, another artery when you need to put the stand, for example, in tibial uh, anterior artery, like, like in this case. Uh, or kissing stands again, uh, as, as I mentioned before. And also you can uh, use uh, for French compatible device uh, and angus you do too in this uh, in the same case uh, so we can connect many many uh, equipment and uh, get really nice results in any uh, problems with uh, superficial femoral artery and below and not only this uh, but it's not the topic of, of today presentation you can use this also to, to fist well or something like this as a summary, we would like to underline most important uh, things. Uh, so, using uh, for French uh, sheet below inguinal ligamentum give you possibility to perform most procedures with a lower rate of uh, complications. 
And second thing, uh, that if you want to use four French uh, compatible devices, you can uh, also use a bigger sheet uh, to receive more treating options and um, easily deal with uh, complications. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us right now or later by email. Okay, uh, Miguel, you're running it. You're on. You're yes, on. Uh, oh. this, uh, I really appreciate uh, this. Now, one of the things that we've been doing more and more yeah. is seeking transpedal approach for a lot of these procedures. And I think that, that uh, you know, despite all the great things that you guys already said, I would add to that, that there is a group of patients that may just get excellent results from getting a small forefront sheath and you can do an entire intervention and put a TR band for radial intervention and literally have the patient walking with less than one hour of their procedure. Would you care to comment if you've had any experience in deploying this device from the forefront transpedal approach? And if not, do you believe that that may be something interesting for patient care? Uh, with the pedal access, uh, yeah, we sometimes uh, do this, but uh, in most cases we don't use uh, the sheet when uh, only guide wire and uh, catheter like uh, Navicross, for example. But sometimes if, if you need to, of course, you can use for French sheet. Before this, you should uh, do, uh, inject uh, nitroglycerin, I think. My, my so we, what we sometimes do with some of our patients that are very obese or have radiation of the groins, if what we're looking is an SFA intervention and they have very juicy tibial vessels, what we'll put is a micro four French terumo, do the procedure, and then even through that, you could actually deploy this, this particular stent because of its low profile. Yeah. So I think that's a, a great opportunity where you don't even have to mess with a complicated groin uh, and or have to upsize your sheath. Yeah, of course, especially, especially among uh, obese patients. It's, it's, it's good. Well, I use a lot of four French uh, below the knee punctures, and honestly, um, I'm not really actually convinced that the radial band or any kind of compression is necessary. Most of these holes just close up by the, you know, the time you compress it for like ten minutes, yeah, or five minutes. It's not really necessary, honestly. Yeah? It's it's cheaper to have a fellow put a finger than use a TR band, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it just it just doesn't happen. I think I. Uh, for the past couple of four years, I think I've only had one bleed, and that was after tibial perineal puncture in a patient on dual antiplatelets. So you know, kind of fat, wobbly legs and stuff like that. But otherwise, there's just no bleeding after these punctures. Absolutely, they Perfect. can be up in the bar even less than an hour, in my opinion. And do you guys know? Again, this is just ignorance on my end. What's the longest four French? Uh, stent scaffold that that there is out there uh on let's say a, a standard six millimeter for sfa what's the longest one you could get Two hundred. Uh, can, uh, can you repeat question the longest four french stent that's available commercially i i just don't don't know and i don't use it that much miguel at 200 millimeters oh, sorry. 100. 100. 200 200 200 200 okay that's a very interesting yeah, we don't have the, the, the thing is that you have to remember that the pulsar is a very low radial force stent. It's actually not, you know, for occlusions, it's not it's not a super stent. It has yeah, it's, it's 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 fabulous if you have, for example, dissections, something that is like fairly, fairly uh, soft plaque. But if you want to cross the occlusion and you put a pulsar 18 in it, it just doesn't really work for long. You have to have something with a bit more radial force. Understood. Understood. This, a sinus. Uh, uh, this sinus. is uh, Jan Skowronski. I think uh, Miguel will have to move forward. Okay. Yeah. Yes, a please. A couple of our panelists from the next session. Uh, have uh, another no commitment. Okay. Fantastic. Uh, let me go straight to this presentation then. And obviously, first of all, appreciate uh, the invitation, Jan. Uh, you've done a phenomenal job here. I'm in the middle of the cath lab in Houston in Texas. And uh, to avoid a ugly wall, I decided to put this space thing because we're about to hopefully throw a, a new spaceship in uh, this upcoming Saturday. So anyway, right. celebration of what Houston was and maybe will be again, Space City here for you. Um, I wanted to bring together a lot of these concepts into this contemporary management of CLTI patients. 
I don't have any particular disclosures to go against this slide set. Um, but I believe that times have changed. And I think that all of us today in the last two sessions have shown what we're seeing, which is we're not necessarily pursuing so many of these Marlboro men with high, big aortic occlusions, but we're getting really populated with a bunch of patients with diabetes and extensive below the knee tibial uh, disease. Obviously, on top of that, many of these patients have renal failure. If you look at the impact of such calcification patterns, we look at contractile normal smooth muscle that eventually becomes an osteochondritic smooth muscle. So we're getting medial calcifications. And if we only look at where dialysis is going, I think that we're looking at some very extensive disease patterns of this, which I believe is the nightmare for everybody. And I think the second to last presentation was phenomenal in stating what can we do for some of these patients as we move forward? Now, I believe that I, this may not be the same all around the world, but here in America, every block or two, you have what we call a vein annihilating centers. And all they do is they sap everything that comes into contact because it's been becoming a booming, uh, uh, unfortunately, business. And it's driven a lot of the reimbursement in the venous market that ends up killing all GSVs or saphenous veins. And on top of that, we have a very, very old population with projections of a complete change for 2050, where we're going to have 39% of patients above 70 years old. Unfortunately, they don't all look like Schwarzenegger. They all usually look like this. And we certainly have and understand what physiologic reserve means and how in increasing age, this drops, defining what we call the geriatric syndrome reflecting a state of decreased physiologic reserve and vulnerability to stressors, which increases the risks of adverse outcomes, including falls, delirium, and disability. So I believe if we can create a succinct uh, a status of, 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 the, of the current times, we have an older and more frail population. We have a dramatic change in disease patterns secondary to the rise of diabetes and renal failure. Adequate conduit is becoming a rare commodity for us vascular surgeons. And precision medicine and especially personalized care, I believe, is going to become more of an issue. Now, many scenarios that we have to look at, and this is kind of how we do it here in the Save the Extremity program at Baylor College of Medicine, but we determine your indication. We look at Wi-Fi scores, which include wound, ischemia, and foot infection. We determine the frayability and nutritional status by certain wearable sensors that we have ongoing studies with. Obviously, anatomy of disease, which in today we've probably gone away from task and accepted more of the global vascular guidelines and the determination of conduit and or if this is good conduit or not conduit. We're also looking at an ischemic threshold and what that ischemic threshold is, which probably has to do with the patterns of disease, the wound care uh, and the advances of wound care or networking even that the patient may or may not have and the comorbidities and the nutritional status that that patient may have. That determines this ischemic uh, threshold. This is Conti. Conti is the chief of San Francisco. He's a very classic, very smart, articulate man, and I could not disagree more with him. And I've said that to his face, where I don't necessarily think you can just create two boxes to determine who should get open and who should get endo, because all of these variables don't become as black and white as it's tried to portray it in this paper from 2013. The grays have escalated. This is an oversimplistic approach to a very complex uh, problem. Now that said, I do agree with Mike in the sense that a lot of the stuff that we have with endo has come uh, in a way where, where we can't really even stop it. It's a tsunami of products. Sometimes you, you have even a hard time understanding where you're at. And when you finally understand how to do something, it apparently becomes a thing of the past. So we do have to try to create objective performance goals and good clinical trial designs. And quite frankly, thus far for chronic limb threatened ischemia, I think we are behind the eight ball. So determining what's sexy versus what's better, that's something that we have to try to define in a more, uh, you know, a, a broader way. Surgery continues to be surgery and it's a very useful thing, but we cannot look away from the fact that there are perioperative morbidities like cardiovascular events, need a blood product, 
prolonged hospital stays, requirement of skilled nursing facilities and rehab places, surgical site infections, and graft infections. When you look at the mortality, when you compare large data sets, it's interesting that in the complex subset of patients that have CLTI, the mortality could be comparable, although some people believe it's higher with surgery. I also would like to bring a definition that Wi-Fi scores are very much a tool now because if I pick up the phone and I call my friend uh, in Brazil and I discuss a Rutherford 5, it could be any of these things or a Rutherford 6 could be any of these things. But having a broader definition of what the type of wound, the extension of the wound, the area of the wound has a lot to do with what we do to these patients. So we try to look at three spheres where we have the limb status, the patient status, and the anatomy, and try to put all of that in the context of having an appropriate classification. We know from some old data, old data, that conduit is absent in up to 40% of the patients. I'll assure you that if we would run this study again in 2020, that is probably dropping down to the 10 to 15% of patients that do have a good conduit. And when I mean a good conduit is a beautiful GSV of three, five millimeters or above with no scarring, no evidence of any, uh, you know, past uh, acute thrombotic event or insufficiency. When we look at some of the data of distal bypasses for below the knee and extensive disease, certainly the permeability of such bypasses is actually very uh, minimal. And when at some point, uh, we had cadaveric veins, which are now for sale at a high price. And you look at the data of cadaveric veins, it's also very detrimental. So I think that those surgical principles haven't changed for the last probably 50, 70 years of our development specialty. You can't work if you don't have a conduit. You can't work if your inflow or outflow are not there. And you can't work it in an inadequate patient. But on the other hand, you hear things like this from this particular article saying CLI patients have a disease pattern that's not amenable to endovascular therapy and require crural bypasses for adequate revast. Now, I believe that that's just pure baloney. I think that we've developed a very adequately our techniques, and we have, as we've shown throughout the hours here of this, techniques that allow us to drive wires anywhere into the distal arteries of the foot. We are able to poke into the smallest vessels if we need to and get retrograde access. And these are cases that I've done here uh, in our facility. But at the same time, when we need them, there's nothing wrong with a beautiful vein and a distal SFA all the way down to the dorsalis pedis bypass, as we've shown in this article. And this was from as soon as last week. So I'm trying to make myself immortalized by quoting myself on a presentation from 2018 because nobody quotes me. So, I mean, you got to just do it for yourself. But I said something like developed with the development of robust technical skills and more appropriate technology, operators are able to treat more complex and distal patterns. And this perfect storm of technical skills and advanced tools makes the decision what's possibly relevant, but the decision, the question what's appropriate extremely relevant. And I think that that's probably the area where we should put more efforts, perfusion, measurement of oxygen, what are the goals, what leads to adequate wound care in what kind of patient. So yeah, you can do everything, but it requires really good special specialty training and skills. You want to do distal bypasses, learn how to do them. They're not the same as a FEMPOP. You want to do distal access, learn. It's not the same. This is kind of how we go here. It's a very quick, and this is my second to last slide. Ischemic lead, do you need rebask or not? Do you have medical optimization? What's your frailty, your op risk, your renal risk, your anatomy, your venous conduit? And then all of that primarily leads us to an endo first approach. Determination of technical success and perfusion evaluation, and if adequate, then optimize medically and wound care. If not, you can certainly try again, but always have the ability to revert to open or the same way, revert to endo from open. So I think it's a very fluid dynamic that you have to have. So in conclusion, my dear friends around the globe, I think this is all about patient and limb-centric approaches. We cannot forget that element in the equation. I think we have to work in hybrid teams or become hybrid doctors ourselves. Be there because we can offer both or because we have good friends and colleagues that can offer either or 
when we need it for the patient. And certainly balance out all possible elements into the algorithm of care to try to come out with the best solution for the patient. And with that, I say thank you very much as the uh, Chief of Operations for Vascular Surgery at Baylor and the president in place right now of Endolab for Latin America. I appreciate your invitation, appreciation to all the team of Icarus and Jan, thanks for having me here. It's great to have you. Uh, it's wonderful. I, I think we learned a lot in, in this session, but it's also, uh, it also shows us the power of will, that almost uh, everything is possible and we see how quickly we are expanding and getting better in what we do. We wouldn't have been, we wouldn't be talking about it 10 years ago, for sure. Thank you. Greg, uh, back to you. Yes, uh, Miguel, thank you. It was a uh, fantastic uh, presentation because I am, I'm also a vascular surgeon doing the endo. So uh, we, we, we have to talk not only about the endo, we, we should also talk about the open. Sometimes, if, if, sometimes it's better for the patient to do the distal bypass than to try uh, you know, many, many techniques which uh, that doesn't work. So again, thank you very much. Thank you that, that you, 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 you are together with us. Thank you. All right, so thank you all the participants, but I have uh, one more question to Thomas from Vilnius. How it looks like in, uh, in your country, uh, who performs the endovascular procedures? General uh, vascular surgeons, radiologists, or angiologists? Explain us. So Thomas? it depends yeah. from hospital to hospital. And uh, so personally, I am performing both open and endovascular, uh, also all these uh, distal punctures and so on. Uh, in some hospital, car hospitals, cardiologists are performing, but actually the shear of the procedures is growing uh, to vascular surgery field uh, year to year. So uh, I think it's shifting to maybe 90% will be vascular. In uh, surgeries. So uh, actually we are doing the same interventions what uh, we have seen what uh, Miguel Baker uh, has shown us so from technical perspective uh, it's the same we are trying to measure oxygen and, and we fail with these measurements uh, but um, yes so, so it's uh, the real life. Okay, thank you. So next time you, you have to show us your case. Uh, I, th I thank you all the participants for being with us. Thank you. So see you to the, um, probably we will see you uh, at the next webinar. Thank you.